to explore pathways towards more healthy and regenerative cultures. Uh, we are on week three and we have again with us Anna Rods. Welcome, Anna. And I'm here, Nuno, with my colleague Eva hosting these interviews. We are uh, invite we invited Anna to, to join us today and have a conversation around one body of practices called process work, uh, which was developed by Arnie and Demi Mindell some decades ago. It has been a, a growing body of work spread all around the world. And if you don't know Anna yet, uh, you're going to get to know a bit of her, an amazing person, amazing human being. Anna, you've been a consultant for organizations, a trainer, a therapist, an executive coach. You've worked for the last 15 years as a facilitator for individuals and groups in a huge diversity of settings. Um, one of the places more, perhaps more known is you've been involved quite a lot in different places, in different roles within the Findor Neco Village in Scotland and within the global eco village uh, network in general you've trained people in many different practices and you now run your own consultancy business working with a, a diversity of, of clients from ranging from civil society corporate or uh, public institutions so let's get started by Hearing a bit of your of, of your story with how how you, you came about the work of of Arnie and Amy Mindell of process work, and why it became such an important part of your own uh, practice and and body of work. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I I got in touch with uh, the body of work of Arnold and Amy Mindell and colleagues uh, when I was very young, actually. Um, I am now in my early 40s, 41. And I was 17 years old when I left home. I uh, left Spain when I was 17. I was um, already going through a very challenging journey personally around my relationship to myself and to the world around me, my environment, the purpose of life, the meaning, why, why, why would I wake up in the mornings and go to university and follow a pattern of life that I was told it was the useful pattern of life, of living. And I couldn't really understand it. And I had been in the in the psychiatric system for a few years when I was younger, in my early teenagers, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, for different reasons. And I felt very uh, unhappy. That's the simple word. I felt unhappy and angry. I was just a very angry, young teenager that hated myself and hated the world around me. That was my major attitude. And, um, and I knew I had to do something. I was just so uninspired. And I thought my life was worthless. I really did. So I left and I went traveling and, and I found out about the Finon Foundation, which is an eco village, a spiritual community and a center dedicated to holistic education and an NGO, an international NGO. And I arrived there and I became a gardener at the beginning. So I was a gardener for many years and being a gardener at the beginning, I really learned about the cycle of life and nature. And I learned to be more sensitive to my own needs and the needs of nature. And I, I really, it was the beginning of learning to relate for me, to relate with a level of kindness. I really didn't know what kindness felt like. Uh, have, having been in the psychiatric system under very difficult conditions when I was very young. So in Finhorn, the most amazing thing happened. You know, when I got there, I was told something that changed my life forever. They said to me, Anna, your life matters because you are 
part of a network of life. Every single creature is part of a network of love and light. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? Me? I'm just angry all the time. How can I be part of a network of love and light? What? What? I couldn't, right? But they really, they said, that's, that's the way we see you. And your life matters. And everything you do will leave an impact and has an impact. And I, I just, I, I was amazed at this concept. And my life started to change because I started to really notice that my life was an act of love. It was an act of relationship, an act of interaction, an act of value, value towards others and towards myself. And I talk about love, not as, not as a romantic, no, I talk about love as a, as a movement of interaction that I give freely. And during those days, while I was practicing and learning about kindness and relationship, being a gardener, I met some of the initial students that, are, that were at that time the first generation of teachers uh, that they studied with Arnold and Amy Mindell, Rainy Hauser, uh, Jan Dworkin, and Leslie Mons. And they came to Finland to give a workshop in process-oriented approach or process work. You can call it process-oriented psychology, approach, or process work. And I decided to do it. I was very young. I was um, at that time 18. And I decided to try it. And I remember being in this, in this workshop. And I remember the first thing I heard as well, really like, also changed me and it related so much to my journey in Finland of really understanding that I was part of a network and that my life mattered because it had an effect and an impact in the world and they said to me I remember one of the main principles of process-oriented approach or process work is that um, learning to go with what they call the natural rhythm of our life, or the Tao. One of the influences of process work is a Taoistic approach, which is an ancient Chinese approach, or an ancient Chinese philosophy that looks at life and says, how can I go with the rhythm of my life and with the river, the natural river of my life? And of course, to me, that was also, it was crazy. I thought, what? I'm always fighting with the natural river of my life. I'm always going against it, swimming against it. So much effort. I'm always tired. I have a tendency towards depression. I mean, what? The natural rhythm of my life? That's impossible. And then, and then I understood that there is a natural rhythm in the way I relate and in the way I move through the world and the way the events happen in my life. And that, that, and that welcoming the natural movement of events in my life and seeing them as teachers and as encounters of learning. And I understood in that moment, I thought, right, that, is, that must be the path of least resistance. That must be the path of least resistance. And here is this, I was so tired of fighting that I thought this method is going to work for me. It's going to change my life. So this understanding of being part of a network and, and understanding that my, my, my life in Finhorn was an act of love, an act of giving. And this, uh, this other main understanding for me or aha that I could learn to go with the rhythm of my life and my natural events and welcome them as they came along and just the feeling of effort effortness of less effort I just I remember lying down in bed you know while I was doing my first process work workshop training lying down in bed and falling asleep so calmly which had never happened before i never until that time knew what it was to sleep in a more relaxed way so that's how i met um, actually the initial beginnings of my relationship 
uh, of a process-oriented approach. I really went into it because I wanted to have a kinder life, a more natural rhythm, and I wanted to be happier and make and, and have less feeling of effort, you know, and fighting. And so it was a very selfish beginnings for me. It was really about my well-being and my personal journey. Um, and then with the years, of course, I studied in the Irish Process Worker School and in, I went a lot to Portland, Oregon, which is the original home of process-oriented psychology, process work. There are many schools around the world now. I teach in some, in Italy, I teach in Italy, in different places, but really, at the beginning, it was really selfish. <laughs> and then with the years, I became the director of the Finland Foundation for five, six years. I was the executive director. And by then, I really had understood that my life was a river and that I had to swim in it and follow the current of my river and not work so hard at making it happen. And um, I certainly am still learning to swim the river of my life. Uh, my life is not always what I would like it to be. The events that happen in my life, they are not always convenient. Some de sometimes they're extremely painful. Like a few years ago when my mother died of leukemia, um, it was a very difficult river to swim because I didn't want to swim with that natural event. I didn't want to welcome it because I wanted her to get better and to be alive. I still get emotional, but I thought, oh, I'm a process worker. I understand that somehow I need to swim with the rhythm of death in my life now and see death as an ally of my life. One of the hardest things to do was to help my mom die well. That was one of the hardest things I've ever done. But this process approach of seeing death as a signal of life, as a signal in the river of my life, it just gave me the, the, the expansive space to welcome the most difficult events. And that's one of them that is very personal to me, but I've been in many difficult events in my life and facilitating many complex situations. And how do I really follow the process and support the natural river to unfold its life, its unique experience? And that's how I got into process-oriented approach. Needing to be happier and feeling a little bit better and having a slightly better sleep. Yep. Wow, thank you so much, Anna. So one of the things that's striking for me is this shift from <clears throat> this approach that is kind of omnipresent somehow in our cultures of um, on one side of thinking that, that we are responsible for what happens to us in a way that we have a control on some of the events and that we can you know, something like new age, like you can attract what is better for you and move to move away from what is painful in this and, and somehow to connect to a more generative space, I would say of we can, what we can be aware of and work out in a way that serves us better is how, what, how we relate with these events that, that occur. And and so what's a life for us, and then how that informs how that how, how that brings learning and in in ways to relate with those events because we have we have a saying in how we relate with them, not in how they happen, but how we then relate and yeah. what we do with that with those experiences. Yeah, I believe you see process approach. It gives you as tools, many other philosophies, bodies of work. Okay. humanistic, transpersonal, ancient philosophies, ancient traditions, ancient tribes. I think that it's always been this, this feeling that we can collaborate with the rhythm of life. 
We can collaborate with the cycles of nature like a gardener. I can collaborate with the cycles of nature, with the trees and with the winter when the leaves go gray and, and they fall. I can collaborate with death and I can collaborate with the spring, with life. So I think what you are talking about, it's really how can we stay engaged and in collaboration with the cycles of life and with the events, with the conflicts that come along, with the tensions and with the incredible sunrises. Right. So I think it really is how can we use tools, skills and approaches to stay in an awake, collaborative, collaborative journey with the rhythm of life and the cycles and the movement of evolution. So for me, I really see it as a collaboration. Could you offer us some more insights into like what what because you mentioned like one of the things you mentioned already is the the influence of tao philosophy in the in the um, in in the way the practice the body of practice has emerged i can, i also know that they, that it has had some that uh, arnie and amy had some huge influence of uh, jungian uh, work um could you tell us a bit like what make this body of practice is kind of unique for you and give some maybe some practical examples of, of its user, usage that has uh, been really um, transformational for you? Yeah, so uh, maybe I say a little bit about the roots of process-oriented approach and, and weave into it some of the principles. Um, so one of the roots of process oriented approach is um let's let's maybe i can continue with this concept of the taoistic influence or as well aboriginal traditions right uh, they uh, um, it, it it draws knowledge and wisdom from the taoistic perspective which is the resistance as i said calling following the process and collaborating with the process to be unfolded, following the signals and the natural events of any given moment and using the skills to unfold the journey instead of to control it or to fix it or to change it. So process approach, it is not a pathological approach that says we are broken and we need to be fixed. Right? It doesn't create a pathology of the human journey of evolution, the individual psychology or the collective psychology. Right? It really t looks at unfolding evolution and unfolding the process as it shows itself. Right? And um, it also uh, has quite a bit of um, influence as well from um, the concept of the concept of alchemy which is another uh, philosophy very important philosophy right uh, alchemists would um, create this incredible gold out of the most complex soups right do they would have this big thing this yeah tab and they would put all sorts of different ingredients in it and ingredients that maybe were not so important by themselves and they would put them all together and they would cook it and cook it and cook it together until gold would come out until a collective process would emerge so basically speaking a little bit roughly they would like trying to find gold in the ship right? Saying it roughly. They would look for the gold and they would cook the shit until gold would appear. Basically, insert in some simplistic uh, way of talking, right? So in some ways, we have, um, we bring in that concept, that concept when conflict happens, when difficult events happen, and all sorts of difficult components come together in one soup, in one bowl, in one moment, in a given situation, potentially impossible situations. I mean, look at the political situation right now. It looks impossible. I have facilitated very difficult situations that feel impossible, right? And process work in that moment welcomes that concept of alchemy, 
and says, let's cook together, let's cook the roughness, the shit, the difficulties, the challenges, let's sit in the fire of the cooking until we find different ways of relating, understanding yourself, understanding the opponent, understanding the most difficult thing to understand and build relationship between the opposites. And in that process, the gold of new cultures, new relationships can emerge. Cultures that have a little bit of all the components, right? The soup, you could say the soup, an incredible soup can, can come through. And of course, from that perspective, what it does is it really welcomes conflict as a, as a golden moment, a place that gold can come through and insight and future evolution can emerge, right? So it really sees conflict as an act of love, a process of unfolding a more collaborative understanding of the diversity, right? So it really welcomes diversity uh, like an alchemist, right? It also has other roots like um, um, homeopathy you know the concept of homeopathy homeopathy talks about when you are ill or you have a, a problem you take a little bit of the problem a little bit you take the essence of the problem to help you address the problem so we also believe in going deep into the conflicts and try to support and create the spaces and facilitate the spaces that walk towards the deepest part of the conflict, the hidden part, in order to try to find in some ways the useful powers that we need that are hidden in that part. And I'll give some examples later. So, but, but really these concepts of alchemy and homeopathy welcome diversity and really support you to value conflict and value, so to speak, difficulties, illnesses, challenges, right? And support you to try to be curious about the useful aspect of that difficulty. What is it that that difficulty brings that wants us to become aware of in order to collaborate better with the world and the situation, right? So those are like more philosophical threats. I mean, I'm talking about the basic ones. I'm not going to bring in all of them. It also has some very strong clinical threats because process work is, process approach is a therapeutic approach. It's also a systems awareness approach and it's also a relationship approach. So it works uh, at a therapeutic level. It also works at a facilitation level of systems, groups, organizations, and something called world work, which is social, political change, world issues. We also work with groups of up to four or 500 people to deal with world situations and world issues. So we work with individuals, relationships, small groups, organizations, communities, cultures, and also world events and world issues. So it has also a very strong um, a clinical approach in it, which comes from Jungian psychoanalysis and Jungian psychology. And it has all sorts of skills and tools, like um, skills and tools around uh, channels of information, around um, unfolding of processes, right? PNL, yeah, brings in. It has a little bit of a style, a little bit of different approaches in it to support human psychology to address human psychology, from communication, to marginalized experiences, to traumas, dreams, altered states, addictions, coma states, death and life states, right? So it has also a lot of Jungian. And it also has a lot of quantum physics or modern physics. Arnold Mindel was a physicist 
and a Jungian psychoanalyst. So he tried to bring in human psychology and cosmos psychology. Quantum physics is about the movement of the universe and how do we relate what uh, the movement of the quantum field or the bigger field and how those laws apply in group work, in relationships and individual work, right? And um, it works quite a bit with the concept of teleology. So process work is a teleological approach, meaning it looks for purpose and meaning. Teleology is about purpose and meaning. So we believe that any experience holds purpose and meaning. It has a sense of direction, so a sense of finality, a movement towards something, and a deep meaning to it. So it's, um, we don't really, in some ways, it's, it's a bit less causal, meaning that we don't think, I, Anna, I am who I am because of my past. Yes, but it's not complete. I'm also a teleological creature. I am my past, but I'm also my future. In this moment, there is the past and the future. So in any given conflict, there is a history, a past, but there is also a future, a potential future that lives in the conflict. You have the history that needs to be worked on and talked about in many situations, but you also can activate the future a narrative, a new narrative, right? So there is also a teleological movement to it, which I think is very important. Um, it's, um, there is also another thing that is quite important is that uh, from the quantum physics or the modern physics, we really um, think about non-locality and the concept of non-locality, meaning that I can be working or dealing or facilitating an inner conflict inside of me. And I'm also at the same time while I'm working inside of myself, that has an effect on the world conflict because there is a non-local power to awareness. Awareness is non-local. So when I work on myself, there is also an effect in another part of the world. And if I choose to work on my rage, on my, on my feelings of violence in this moment, you know, many people with this coronavirus are feeling a lot of rage and a lot of violence. So if I, if I choose to address my rage and my violence, it's non-local. The spirit of violence is non-local. So I'm also addressing collective rage and collective violence, right? So we, we are, um, it's a multidimensional method and a holistic related method. Yeah? And, uh, and that's, I think, very important to, to remember non-locality in these days. I mean, if you think about the coronavirus, right? Think about how non-local it is. It crosses boundaries, it crosses frontiers, it crosses walls, it crosses class, age, gender, sexual orientation. It, it crosses, right? So it's a very non-local force. And if you think about the quantum movement and the field, the interconnected field that we are all a part of, right? Process work really welcomes the concept of the quantum mind or the, or the interconnected field. We are particles and a wave. We are all expansive and we are also a particle. This is only a little part of the wave, right? So I am a wave and I am a particle. So whatever I do and who I am, it's local, it's here, it lives in Spain, it relates with the issues in Spain, but it's also a wave. It's non-local. Yeah, I'm also sensing that in, in that's also bringing that sense of 
of uh, what we do as as a, it shapes reality no matter the distance so this and, and there's another interesting thing that is coming from you hearing you talk about the the, the field is that change doesn't happen both on an individual level and also on a on a on, on a more collective scales uh, of big plans it's like little fluctuations that combine bring a shift so i'm really interested in what kind of concrete practices process work brings that because i think part of it is a lot related with awareness mm -hmm. both individual and collective awareness of what's happening in a, a given situation in a given event within each one of us and as we become more aware the system also becomes more aware let's say the whole and then the that allows the the natural flow to to continue its path somehow that's what i'm kind of reading from a bit from hearing you and that's very interesting because it also involves us doing something a fundamental shift from uh, distrust to deep trust in 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 ourselves and in each on each other and our capacity to stay in the trouble and have that kind of composting process to take place because the natural tendency all of us is deeply embedded in our patterns is immediate response and fix and uh, is when i want to say I'm, I'm a brother of a psychologist and i love i have been having these conversations with her for a long time how much the the pathological perspective of human nature and putting us in like ideal behavior uh, boxes and then everything that goes away from that ideal is problematic and we need to fix how that is getting us caught in a, in a patterns of 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 uh, behavior that are problematic for us so yeah just just that's what's coming for me. I don't know even if you have, if it's coming a, a particular question, but I, me, I'm really curious on what kind of concrete practices uh, it, uh, the process work entails. Yeah, so I can say a few practices. I mean, maybe to say one more thing that it's important about the roots is that, I mean, basically process work brings shamanic practices, the shamanic aspect of life shifting aspects the ability to travel between realities and shape, shape shift into different parts of who we are, right? So this shamanic nature of life and uh, mystical traditions, quantum physics, Jungian psychology. So there is this kind of threads from different sectors. And, and it has practices for individual work, for inner work. It has inner work as a very important aspect of the practice because it is really addressing addressing your most local experience of who you are right your inner work is addressing yourself here and now and really developing a psychology that is more fluid more resilient and that can really welcome diversity internally so process work really tries to create a strong inner work practice to welcome inner diversity and fluidity and the ability to grow in our identity to hold the widest awareness of the self right it also has practices in the relationship channel in relationship um, it also has practices in a small group family work, also in organizational work, and, it, and also in global work or world work, which is social political change. So it has a different levels of practices because it is very multidimensional. And maybe to say a couple of things about um, one of the key, one of the key elements of process work is what we it's called deep democracy is the practice of deep democracy and deep democracy is an experience it's an attitude and it's also a method of practice right for the individuals relationships groups 
organizations, communities, and global work. Right? And deep democracy is the concept that it comes from the experience that life is multidimensional. Let me just make, I made a little note of it here because it's useful. Otherwise, I get so excited that I will talk too much about it. <laughs> Let me try to find my little note, if I can find it now. Oh, yeah, well, while, you, while you find it, uh, one of the things is striking for me is that, and I want to just like um, name it, is that process works were, uh, addresses the, the inner dynamics of human beings, the relationships and, and patterns, and both on a small and large scales, and then the structural aspects. Because when you talk about political, cultural, I'm thinking about structural things that are in place that also are at the root cause of many of, or let's say are, are, are also at the base of many of the struggles we find ourselves in. So that's kind of really, in a way, a very holistic uh, body of work. And you can sense from the multiple um, inspirations that is is kind of a, that Amy and Army made, a, and other, the other practitioners have been making a huge uh, body of work of synthesis of different inspirations and practices. So it's it's in a way a meta body of practices. Just want to say that. So yes, yeah, it, please. Uh, it has a combination of different threads. I sometimes think about process work as a braid, <laughs> right? Of different threads. So so yeah. I so basically I wanted to say about deep democracy. Deep democracy is really a very core principle of process work and deep democracy is a method, it's a skill, and it's also what we talk about, a meta skill, an attitude towards ourselves and others and the world and groups, right? And it's the basic idea that um, there is a multi-layer experience of life. Life is multi-layered. It's like the idea of a space jumping. Imagine we are like astronaut, astronauts, right? And we are doing jumps in space, hyperspace jumping. <laughs> so life is a multi-layer experience. And, um, and there is a structural aspect, aspect of life, of the experience of life, which is a more measurable aspect is a more intentional, intentional aspect, meaning it is an aspect that is more agreed on. It is more political. It is what we talk about consensus reality. Consensus reality is the aspect of life that it is more defined by majoritarian perspectives, right? It is the structure, the law, the facts, the figures. Think about that conflict. Let's talk about conflict in relationship to this, right? So when, when, when we are facilitating a conflict or we are in the midst of a conflict, there is a consensus reality aspect, which is facts, figures, content, the structure of the conflict, what people say about it, right? In terms of the, in terms of groups, is the law what you can do, what you cannot do? If you think about, so, so you mean it's like the, the 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 things that everybody can agree upon, like the common arena, yeah? Yeah, it's like the majoritarian agreements of what consensus reality is and what has happened. And uh, think about, for example. Um, mm, uh, the external aspect of democracy, right? We have a constitution, right? That says all people are equal. So in CR, consensus reality, what we call CR, we have a book that talks about lots of equalities in many parts of the world, not in every part of the world, but in many parts of the world, in Europe for sure, right? Now, even though it says men and women are equal, the black community is also equal to the white community, heterosexual community has the same rights, the, the LGBT community has the same rights as the heterosexual community, right? This is agreements, socio-political agreements, right? Consensus reality, long-term history agreements, right? That have happened over a period of time. 
and there's been changes in consensus reality, but it's not the whole of the experience. We also talk about dreamland, which is the subjective aspect of life. It's the culture, the feeling level, right? It is um, the feeling, the relationships between people, uh, the atmosphere in a group, right? The feelings, the feeling of power, the way power moves in a group, right? Dreamland is a very subjective experience of safety or non-safety, of power or non-power, right? Consensus reality is a structural experience. Consensus reality talks about external privileges, political privileges, rank privileges in relationship to social rank, a structural rank, right? Organizational positions. But Dreamland talks about a very fluid world of experience. For example, let's think about leadership. Leadership from a process perspective is a Dreamland experience. You may be the director of an organization. That doesn't mean you have the leadership qualities, right? You are the director. But it doesn't mean leadership is a collective experience that belongs to everyone. So in Dreamland, there is lots of dream, dream role experiences like abuse, victim, aggressor, leadership, joy, peace, right? All these related experiences. And even though in consensus reality, we make certain agreements at a dreaming level, we don't experience, in, experience it the same. So any given conflict has a consensus reality definition. People speak about it in a consensus reality manner. But the feeling of how people have experienced the same conflict is very different, right? Like think about, think about time, <laughs> time. We have a clock, and in consensus reality, it says 45 minutes. We have 45 minutes for this talk, right? And in dreamland, I say, oh, this, the time passed so fast. 40, it's already gone. And you, Eva, imagine you say, God, that felt like five hours. Five hours we were sitting in that room dealing with that difficulty, right? And for somebody else, they say, oh, it was just, it was nothing. It was so little, right? So the dreaming experience, dreaming is a very powerful experience in process-oriented approach. How to unfold the dreaming, how to bring out the dreaming part of a conflict, the diversity of experiences that people are having, a whole community, it's feeling very diverse around the same conflict. Like in Spain right now, in Spain right now, the other day I did a group process around the coronavirus and the political situation that is happening around the coronavirus online. There was about 300 people. And it was incredible. Many people agreed to certain statements about what the political situation is saying or not saying. There were also loads of disagreements there as well, because consensus reality, even though it's more tangible, is still subjective to the observer, okay? So it's still subjective to the observer, right? But in dreamland, the level of diversity of experience, it was amazing. It's incredible because it's so subjective how we are experiencing this issue right now. Depending of so many things, of your age, of your sexual orientation, of your culture, of your class, or your financial situation, of where you live, right? Some of my friends, live in the countryside and they were saying to me the coronavirus what's what you cannot go out what and i feel completely trapped and we live in the same country just a couple of hours from each other in consensus reality right yeah 
I, so I was thinking like one question I wanted I wanted to ask you Anna regarding this is like what what the what do you see as emerging when you have when you see in groups and in these processes uh, tapping people tapping more into this subjective experience and bringing it to a collective uh, awareness? What do you see like that is like a dynamic that unfolds from that process because we. It's, it, I, I see, I hear you when you say like, we often get stuck in just discussing on the level of consensus reality. And so I, I was curious to see like from your experience, what this work with the dreamland, with, you know, with the subjective experiences of each individual, what that brings. And I think so I see I, Eva, just Eva, do you have something else you want to ask? I see you also. No, Eva. yes, yes, yes. It's just, it's just that um, I think, so from a process perspective, we try to welcome all the levels equally. So we have consensus reality. Deep democracy is the welcoming of all the levels, right? So you have consensus reality, which is figures, facts, the outer definition of people, right? Outer privileges, right? For example, if you are white, black, a certain gender or another type of gender, right? So it's like the the definition of of the boxes of people you could say right the outer fi the outer figures and facts and then you have the dreaming experience which is the huge level of subjective diversity even though there is also a lot of diversity in consensus reality so there is diversity in all levels and then you have the essence level in process work the essence level is this interconnected field is like is like the air that we all breathe is the water that we all swim in right it is that feeling of deep relationship to life and belonging to life it is like that experience of mm, being welcome no matter what into the world right the deepest faith of us people right, in some ways. And it really is like the earth powers, the powers of the universe that give meaning to the most complex situations. So in, in a group, when you are working from, with this perspective, with this method in a group or with an individual or in an organization, you try to really welcome all three levels. If we are going to be deeply democratic, we try to welcome the issues in consensus reality. For example, a group may say, we do something that's called sorting in consensus reality. What are the issues in consensus reality? And some people say, for us, the issue is the colonization. For us, the issue is gender issues still. We want to talk about gender issues. For us, we want to talk about not quite. We want to talk about sexual orientation and we want to talk about the marginalization still of the LGBT community. For us, we want to talk about, you know, white privilege, right? So all these issues in any given moment that come through consensus reality and we try to do a process of sorting. We try to welcome them. And then through a very creative style, we try to find where the heat is, which one is the issue that is the hottest for the group in a given moment. Not because it's the most important, but it is the one that has heat, the highest level of heat. So it is, you could say, we talk about it as the hotspot. It's the one that is gonna take us more deeply into the more wider experience that is going to affect everyone, right? So we try to really find where the hotspot is in terms of consensus reality and hold it for a little while because all the issues are important. So all of them. And sometimes you do one issue, you start with one issue, you go into it, and then all the others start to appear again, and right? So once we have a little bit of like a framework of having heard consensus reality and we, we decide on an issue and start through a particular window, then we welcome all the voices. We go into dreamland and we say, what are all the experiences, all the voices of dreamland in relationship to this issue? So I'll give you an example. Um, 
For example, um, with the coronavirus, we agreed to work with the issue of the coronavirus. It's a very wide window, right? And there were many voices in Greenland that came up. Somebody said, uh, I want to say that I think that it was time that we were, we were feeling death. So somebody brought in the voice that death was very necessary for humanity right now as an impact, right? But then, of course, voices come in opposites. So if death comes up as a voice in the field in relationship to the coronavirus, life comes up as well. Somebody else said, well, I actually think that we need to focus on life right now because we need to rebuild our future, right? So then all sorts of voices, and as one comes up, the opposite tension gets called into the field. So if somebody said, like somebody said, well, for me, the virus is bringing a dictatorship. We are living in a dictatorship. We are now having a dictatorship. It's always been there. And we now have a very clear dictatorship. Spain is a dictatorship. And then suddenly, the opposite voice came up, right, very quickly, saying, well, I actually think that I feel more the revolution. I think Spain is a revolution. It's been a revolution for a long time. It's unruly. It's difficult, right? So in dreamland, as one voice comes up, the opposite comes up. And what we do, we try to welcome the tensions of the opposites to unfold the opinions instead of oppressing the conflict, we try to unfold it so that it comes out and becomes so clear that it can see itself, it can hear itself, it can move and it can understand itself. And sometimes it's extremely difficult and extremely messy, especially if you work with very difficult issues, for example, when I've worked with issues of abuse and sexual abuse in groups, I can assure you dreamland, it's very difficult because there is a victim, there is an aggressor, there is a stories of rape, stories of pain. Then there is also a stories of freedom, a stories. And so to occupy all the roles, we welcome all the roles and try to occupy all the roles so that the field welcomes all its diversity. And we can really hear all the voices. And it's sometimes very difficult, sometimes it's very painful, but it's also very healing. Because could, you, could, you tell us, could you tell us in more detail about one of those stories of where the, there were those opposites that felt so intractable and, and how that, that transformation happened? Yeah, so for example, uh, I, the other, well, um, I think it was about four months ago, um, I was doing um, a group process and uh, there were different topics in the group that were very hot. I remember suicide was one of them. Suicide in the Western world was one of them. There was uh, also another very huge theme that was um, ecology and climate change. There were many different different themes, and we ended up working with uh, abuse as an old story and a story that keeps repeating in terms of the use of power. Sexual abuse came up very strongly, and of course, it was very complicated because as we agreed to that topic and we went into dreamland, gender became a part of abuse. Right. So there was an issue around uh, so many women that had been um, misused sexually by males that it became also very gender oriented. And loads of stories of abuse started to come. Um, they are stories that in consensus reality, they are marginalized. In consensus reality, we don't welcome the stories of abuse so easily. It's very difficult to speak about abuse. There are stories that are still really oppressed and there is a lot of shame about it. 
So then in dreamland, it really, that role of the person that has gone through abuse really came out. And there was a lot of women that had gone through a lot of sexual abuse. Yeah. Now, at some point, male voices are starting to come out as well of sexual abuse, not just women, because abuse belongs to all. But of course, it was also a bit gender oriented because of the oppression of women. So then male voices started to come out. But for a moment, that was a bit difficult because the gender issue potentially got a bit in there because uh, some women suddenly started to feel that, wait, you, you have a lot of time. You speak more than us as males. So, but it was about abuse, you see? So the topics in Dreamland, the topics mix and the roles are so strong, right? And so at the end, the male part of also could come in and speak about the abuse. So for a while, we talk about ghost roles. The ghost role was the abuse itself, to be able to tell the stories of abuse. That was a ghost role, meaning a ghost role is a voice that is very good to talk about because consensus reality and the majoritarian perspective is very afraid of it. It's very against it. Like, like in a heterosexual world to bring in the LGBT voice, right? The majority is very against it. So it, it's many times a ghost role in many dialogues, the LGBT voice, right? In this case, the abuse itself was a ghost role. But later, as that voice took a space, male and female, what became a ghost role was the abuser. The voice, the opposite, the voice that speaks about how am I an abuser? How do I abuse people that have less privilege than me, less power? And how do I misuse my power in an abusive aggressive, violent, at times, psychological manner. So of course that was so difficult because we all have a level of abusive energy inside of us, right? In process work, the individual is a hologram of the collective. I have all the voices inside of me. But of course, imagine in a group, in a group to say, First, how difficult it was to say, I want to talk about my abuse story. And then to say, I, I think I have a tendency that is abusive. I, I know I want to talk about my abusive nature and bring it out and pick up the abuser, right? So in dreamland, in process work, we try to welcome all the voices because they all need a place in the process of evolution, we need to understand the abuser as well as the abused in us. Of course, it was very difficult. That's called a ghost role because it's a ghost in the field. The role is there, but nobody speaks for it. There is no host, right? So the role is there, but there is no host. So, so the, the, the role that is, that is speaking about being abused is talking to a ghost, right? All that energy, I want to say never again. You'll never do it again to me, right? And there is nothing in the other side, right? It's, it's empty because it's a ghost. So how do we support us to also occupy the ghost? In order to be able to what? To complete the dialogue and complete the healing and really have all the parts relate. And in process work, we say that the roles are bigger than the people, meaning a role can be occupied by many, can be occupied by a whole tribe. A whole tribe can, can occupy a role. Loads of different cultures, roles are occupied by many. So the roles are bigger than people. And also, People are bigger than the roles, meaning that if I, if any person can be the abuser. Any person in any given moment can occupy any role. You notice it inside, 
right? And so you know what happened in the group? A guy and a woman, a couple, they have uh, two dogs and they have just become new papas. They are a heterosexual couple and they have just become new parents. And they stepped into the abuser role because they suddenly remembered they were, because they were so tense as parents, they were really abusing the animals instead of getting angry with the babies. They had twins and they had so much anger in them about having twins and they were so frustrated, even though they loved the twins, that they were pouring all, all their anger into the animals. And they suddenly understood that that's what they were doing to their babies in a, in a secondary way, right? So they stepped into the abuser role and they told the story. And then the part that had been speaking about being abused could relate to an abuser in front of them in the moment. And the dialogue could unfold. And the abuser role and this, 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 this system could say, could speak about sometimes the level of extreme anger that they would have, right? And how it's such an extreme attitude of anger, right? And desperation. So basically the whole point is to really support the diversity in dreamland, but also in consensus reality. Sometimes we've had dialogue on sexual orientation and we've had the diversity of sexual orientation represented. And there's been a lot of dialogue about privileges of sexual orientation and that's more CR, right? But there is always a dreaming subjective experience present. So we are really trying to create dialogue between the diversity, all of it, the most difficult and the easiest, right? The polarities, so that we can unfold a new culture, a culture where the power of dialogue and collaboration and welcoming a more diverse biological system and biosphere is more awake so that we can have a more peaceful exchange. Thank you so much. We are really getting uh, amazing, Anna. Thank you. Close to the end. It's it yeah, it's it's amazing. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and, and for me it gets it gets very clear this um, deep relationship between uh, becoming aware of the full range of experiences in, in the whole of the system or of the place we are looking into and how much that allows for what has been stuck to, to get unstuck, to flow. So without, exactly. with just the effort of being, being able to be together dwelling with the, with, exactly. with the, the difficulties and, and the, the, of the situation. So, and we, we, we could also, talk. We could talk much more. I'm sure. Yeah, and we could talk much more. I mean, we also. I also do that kind of work in big corporate organizations. So we look at the issues of their consensus reality, and then we unfold the experiences and the voices, so that they can make more informed decisions. They can be decisions that are more full of the deeper feeling of the experience, right? And uh, and the essence level is very important in group work. Those moments where we talk about temporary resolutions in the midst of the chaos and the storm and the diversity and the polarities, suddenly there is a moment of understanding, of a meeting moment and the atmosphere relaxes and you kind of feel for a moment that you float, even though you are so different. That is yeah, the end. It's you, you just remind me this quote from Rumi. You, you started, uh, you, you welcomed people with a Rumi uh, poem and it, it recalls me the, that quote of beyond right and wrong, there is a, a, a field, there is a place, I'll meet you there. So I guess kind of that's where you, you, you kind of go when you go deeper into this. 
I want to say one thing that I think it maybe was not explicitly explicitly said, but it's kind of really a key aspect of this kind of body of practice is that it's an embodied uh, body of practice. So a lot of what we've been saying, it's through becoming more aware of our sensations and experiences in the body. So and how that is like bringing us closer to this dreamland and to nuances that we might not be particularly noticing. And so, yeah, just, just want to say that and just welcome us to say final yeah. words. It's very, that's very important. No, thank you. It's really a phenomenological body of practice. It's really about noticing your, all the levels in you, your CR, your content, your feeling level, your deeper senses, your movement level. Yeah, you know, and your deepest essence and how to really um, relate in a more deeply democratic way to the experience of who we are. Thank you so much, Anna. It was awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank so you so much. And, yeah. and yes, we could say so much. I mean, I really want to apologize as well to the body of work at one level and to the heritage because I'm sure that uh, there is so much, well, I know there is so much more that I could say. I've only like given, so for any other process worker that is out there listening to it, I <laughs> apologize because I'm sure there is already lots of bits and pieces that could have. Don't, don't apologize. This was, just, this, this was just meant to be a teaser. Yeah. We really encourage all of you listening to the, this interview to go and experience it yourself through the practice and that's where you get most of this so if you feel called and interested go and experiment we really uh, encourage you it's an amazing uh, body i imagine practice. that uh, you will put some because there are all sorts of process work practices all over the world in different schools so i don't know if you will you people can get into the portland institute and into the uk and the spanish one italian there is lots of poland germany uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Wherever you are listening to us, if you if you search for it, you will meet practitioners, and you'll yeah, you'll you'll open up this field of possibilities. So, thank you so much, Anna. Thank you, Eva, for thank you so much, guys, with me on this journey, and see you thank soon. Thank you both of you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.